I realize I'm looking at the name of most likely the murderer, and I'm the only person in the world who knows it. She'd been shot in the head. He took Jay out and strangled him and killed him as quietly as he could. The investigators showed up on my doorstep and told me that they were investigating a family member of mine for murder. That case was one that was very personal to me. I've grown up visiting both Seattle and Vancouver, and Tanya was exactly my age, born in 1969. It could have easily been one of my loved ones that suffered this fate. Every time I hear from one of the family members about what this has meant for them, I feel very strongly that this is for the greater good. So when I saw this, I was like, whoa. Cece Moore is what's called a genetic genealogist. Her job, bring people together using DNA to reveal branches of their family tree they don't know they have. In 2018, she got the case of a lifetime. DNA from a three decades old murder, giving two Canadian families a shot at justice no one imagined. I recall that morning very well because um, Jay and I were really close and we have a, a tradition in the family of of waving goodbye until you're right out of sight. And the way the street went like that, so you had to wave for quite a while. <laughs> and, and he did, and he had his, you know, honking and hand out the window. And... On that morning in 1987, 20-year-old Jay Cook and his 18-year-old girlfriend, Tanya Van Kylenborg, set off from Victoria, BC for what was supposed to be an overnight trip to Seattle, Washington. According to their ferry ticket, Jay and Tanya got to the dock in downtown Seattle around midnight. They were going to sleep in the van, then return home the next day. But by the following evening, they still hadn't arrived back home, and they hadn't called. And uh, we were kind of giddy, I think, as I remember it now, thinking, well, maybe they eloped or something like that. I mean, he was supposed to be home. And he just didn't show up. And now it's like six, seven o'clock. I mean, he's not home. Most people, of course, are saying, we got an 18 and 20 year old here and they're a few hours late, are you kidding me? Um, but my parents were, no, this is, something's wrong. He stuffed a cigarette pack and a tissue down his throat to keep him from making any noise. Detective Jim Sharp has investigated the case for the past decade and a half. I believe that he took Jay out and strangled him and killed him as quietly as he could so that he could come back and tell Tanya, hey, I let Jay go. If you do everything I tell you to do, I won't hurt you and I'll let you go. Six days after the two disappeared, police located Tanya's wallet and keys behind a tavern in Bellingham, Washington. The Cook's family van was found at this intersection nearby. Tanya's body was recovered from a culvert outside town. She had rolled down the side of the road on Parsons Creek Road. She'd been shot in the head. Her bra had been pushed up, even though she still had her shirt and coat on. And she was nude from the waist down. Tanya had also been raped. Two days later, Jay's body was discovered under this rural bridge. You, you called it the darkest of days. Yeah, well, yeah, it doesn't get much worse than that, yeah. I mean, having to identify a family member like that is terrible. So they knew how Jay and Tanya had died, but there was no forensic evidence linking Jay's death to anyone else. 
and no match between the DNA found on Tanya's body and any law enforcement database. It's kind of like, I wish we could just restart the investigation from square one. I mean, there were a lot of tips that had come in years earlier. We probably had 230 names in the file. Names, but as the years passed, no suspects. The only hard evidence, the DNA found on Tanya's body and a palm print. And then this is her and I just relaxing outside on the patio, I think, at family home. I never gave up hope. Um, you know, I, I found that I had to uh, come to terms with or reconcile myself to the fact that the perpetrator might never be held accountable in order to move forward with my life. But I never gave up hope that the, someone would, would be held accountable. When you keep in contact with a family for months or years, you uh, get close with the families. And I, I've, I think I've especially bonded with these two families. The thing that makes me feel bad is that I wish I never would have met them. If Jay and Tanya could be alive today, that would be the most wonderful thing in the world, but uh, they're, they're not here. It started with, uh, my dad called me to say that um, they were gonna have a news conference in Everett. Um, they'd like us to come down and speak and that was to introduce the, the pictures that we got from Parabon. In 2018, Detective Scharf sent the DNA found on Tanya to Parabon Labs, a US company specializing in DNA technology. The program sifts through millions of pieces of genetic information. It slowly begins to build a suspect's appearance. The technique called phenotyping used DNA to predict how Tanya's killer might look decades later. They were able to use this information to even make a shape of a face to make a composite of what the person could look similar to. Am I correct that you didn't want to look at the image? Yeah, I wasn't, I, I was worried that I'd get too upset because I, I honestly thought I would be looking at the killer. And we got like another 120 or 30 tips coming in of people that looked similar to that, but none of them had any connection to our case. Right. So we were making a lot more work for ourselves there. For the families, disappointment. But the breakthrough they'd desperately been hoping for was about to arrive, and from a most unexpected place. The investigators showed up on my doorstep and told me that they were investigating a family member of mine for murder. I realize I'm looking at the name of most likely the murderer, and I'm the only person in the world who knows it except that person. Tonight, a four-decade-old search for one of history's most infamous serial killers may be over. It was a crime-fighting breakthrough, heralded by every media outlet in North America. The Golden State Killer terrorized California with more than 50 rapes and 13 murders over decades. Now, a suspect was apprehended, thanks only to his DNA and his family tree. There was a special on TV uh, where they were covering the Golden State oh, yeah. Killer. Um, right in the middle of the episode, we find out that they're doing exactly what they just did in the Golden State mm -hmm. case to, to ours. I was interested in solving some criminal cases where we had DNA evidence. Being able to use this same type of technology to solve Jay and Tanya's case and several other cases. In recent years, tens of millions have enrolled in what's known as ancestry genealogy, submitting their DNA to family tree websites, searching for unknown relatives. I was just a hobbyist like everyone else. When law enforcement would reach out and say, can you help us stop a serial killer? 
Of course I'd want to do that. You know, you, you try really hard to not get your hopes up too much. Um, because they've been dashed so many times. Because they've been dashed yeah. so many times. It's been 30 years of, you know, hearing it come back and come back and come back. And it was always, you know, that's great. I'm glad they're working on it, but mm -hmm. chances are nothing's going to happen, so. But something was going to happen. Remember the DNA company Parabon Labs? Working with genetic genealogist Cece Moore, they ran the DNA found on Tanya's body through the same ancestry database used to identify the Golden State Killer. Just like that, two matches popped up, one of them a second cousin. Getting a second cousin match on a case was a bit like getting struck by lightning. The investigators showed up on my doorstep and told me that they were investigating a family member of mine for murder. Chelsea Rustad was the second cousin who would lead Cece Moore to the murder suspect. I found her birth date, so I put that in here. And then I said she shared 3.35% of her DNA with our unknown suspect. Now I have to identify her parents. Who are her grandparents? Well, I recognize Talbot immediately from the other Matches family tree. So right away, I knew, aha, this marriage combines the two different families that I'm researching. So then we follow that forward. We say, okay, Patricia Peters married a Talbot and they had four kids. And we've got one male. I realize I'm looking at the name of most likely the murderer and I'm the only person in the world who knows it except that person. The name of that person was William Earl Talbot II. And I'm like, can I really believe this? I can, I check. I went up to the office and I started checking him out. And the first thing that I found out was that he had addresses in the Woodenville Duval area, which was close to where Jay's body was found. And when he shows up seven miles from your crime scene, now you figure that you got a pretty good lead and you work it. Police immediately put Talbot under surveillance. Uh, they followed him and he was driving a semi truck. He pulled up to a traffic light on West Marginal Way at Spokane Street and opened the door to the semi truck and stepped out onto the running board and a paper cup fell out of the truck. And the detectives that were following him uh, watched the light change to green. He slammed the door, drove away. They ran out, picked up the cup, and brought it to me. So could this cardboard coffee cup reveal the killer from 31 years before? They ended up bringing me a lab report that said the person that drank from that cup yesterday is the person that matches the profile that raped Tanya. So, And as, as long as you've done this kind of work, what are you thinking? Well, a rush of emotions hit me and I, I teared up and then I screamed. <laughs> we got him. It's hard to put into words this feeling of relief, of joy, of, of great sorrow that this arrest brings. So after he'd completed the arrest um, and gotten Talbot into the back seat of the car, he called me and called John. And yeah, and, and he's like, hey, guess what? And he's in the back seat of the car and just the hackles went up on my neck. I'm just like, for one of the few times in my life, I was completely speechless. I didn't know what to say. It's like, holy shit. We spoke to William Talbot's family and friends. The picture that emerges is of a disturbed boy who grew into an angry, violent man. Bill had a lot of anger issues, and he kicked me a few times with boots on, and I ended up calling the police. He's been estranged from the family for nearly 20 years. He beat me up, uh, broke my telephone, I had to go to the hospital. The trial here at the Snohomish County Courthouse in Washington would be the first time ever 
anywhere that a murder defendant was linked to the crime using genetic genealogy. In other words, the use of DNA to construct a family tree going back generations that could identify a murderer today at stake not only who killed two young Canadians, but potentially the future of a crucial law enforcement investigative technique. State of Washington versus William Talbot. Were you apprehensive about how this unique first precedent setting use of, of genetic genealogy would be received by a jury? When you have the possibility of him doing it is one in 180 quadrillion, you know that he had sex with Tanya and the person that had sex with her had to be the killer. So in my mind, uh, it was a no-brainer that we were going to get a conviction on this guy. Given the odds, the defense didn't dispute it was Talbot's DNA found on Tanya. But they argued that the sex between them could have been consensual and that she then was killed by someone else. Um, there isn't any evidence, for example, to connect Mr. Talbot with Mr. Cook or to the murder weapon or to the murder weapon of Mr. Cook or to the murder weapon in, um, with Tanya Van Kullenberg. But Talbot's lawyers never contested the admissibility of the family tree evidence that led police to him in the first place. Well, I don't think any of us thought it would come up not guilty. No. I mean, we all knew it had, it had to be. Yeah. You know, you're not sure, you're, you're not so sure that you feel mm -hmm. happy. You're like you're cautious. You're cautious but, but I think we all felt there's just no other way this could come out other than guilty. After a two-week trial and two and a half days of deliberation, there was a verdict. We, the jury, find the defendant, William Earl Talbot II, guilty of the crime of first degree yes. murder as charged in Talbot. Without your DNA having been uploaded to that site, we wouldn't know the name of William Talbot. That's what the investigators told me. They said that without both my DNA and my genealogical research, they could not have conclusively determined that it was him. This is the first time she'll meet the family of the two people her cousin killed. How apprehensive were you that they might not be welcome? Well, um, I guess I, I was prepared for that possibility. Because I'm still technically one of his relatives, if people have feelings about that, they're entitled to them, and I don't blame them. It, it, it should be whatever makes them feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. Chelsea. Yeah. Thank you so much for making space today. Well, thank you. I'm really uh, looking forward to talking to some more. Thank you for uh, for coming today. For decades, all this was unimaginable. But now, from a random search, comes unexpected justice. Your report is now in session. The Honorable Linda Seacrest presiding. Good morning. Please be seated. The jury has found Mr. Talbot guilty of both uh, counts of um, first degree uh, murder with aggravating factors. The court's only possible sentence on each count is to impose a sentence of life without possibility of release. You got thrust into the middle of the worst thing that has ever happened to those two families. So how does that feel for you? It was, um, it was kind of shocking at first. I'm happy that it was able to contribute towards some type of resolution and justice for the family. I was hit by the enormity of what this meant. My work was going to lead to someone spending the rest of their life in prison. So I actually started crying. When I finally went to his room to deal with his things, 
Some of us wanted a shirt or a sweater. You could wear them. You could put them to your nose and smell him. I still have that old sweater in my dresser drawer. And I still, for four years, I still heard him uh, running up the back steps to the kitchen door. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In the U.S., genetic genealogy has so far been used to link at least 60 suspects to unsolved murder and rape cases, some going back as far as half a century. Here in Canada, there have been no trials, no arrests, and just one police force, Vancouver's, that has acknowledged it's using family tree forensics to investigate a cold case file. 